Right, well, the, I mean, the trouble with coming last, uh, last paper, paper giver on a day like today is the, the anticipation that really all that can possibly be said will have been said. And indeed, it has been an incredibly rich day with a wonderful variety of papers and approaches. But actually, Tim Hitchcock's paper has made me see what I'm going to talk about, kind of in a new light, as an attempt to recuperate the historiography of subjectivity and emotion that he is so pessimistic about. Um, my thoughts come largely from the book which Hester just mentioned um, very kindly, and I'm so sorry about the unashamed plug, but there it is. Um, uh, and th this, is, this is a study of historians' uses of personal narratives in their historical work, ranging over centuries and um, a wide geographical area. Okay. So my paper today is a historiographical paper. In 1981, historian David Vincent wrote, if we wish to understand the meaning of the past, we must first discover the meaning the past had for those who make it and were made by it. And that was an early formulation in the British context of the value and importance of studying subjectivity. Since then, I would argue that there are a number of identifiable intellectual influences that have contributed to the gathering momentum of the personal term that Vincent, that Vincent flagged. They include post-structuralism with its focus on language and cultural construction, feminism with its insistence that the personal is political, post-colonialism and its emphasis on reading against the grain of dominant discourse, and psychoanalysis with its stress on the role of the unconscious in human interactions. Whatever the theoretical lens through which historians have viewed the personal, the evidence to which they've turned has come largely from various types of self-narrative. We are becoming ever more adventurous in the genres we embrace. Recent work uses graffiti, embroidery, court depositions, photograph albums, scrapbooks, just to name a few. But it's still the case that the types of personal testimony most widely used by historians are letters, diaries, memoirs, and oral histories. And it's, it's those four that I'm going to be referring to for my examples in what I go on to say. In our enthusiasm for such sources of subjectivity and emotion, if that's what we have, I realise that Tim didn't really have that, but if that's what we have, we shouldn't forget the wariness with which historians have regarded them over the past 40 years. The historiographical preference for hard facts and for working as a historian detective to track the beast of objectivity down to its lair has been strong since the 1920s, if not before. The idea that history should be objective persists in school and university teaching in the UK. And to this day, doubts are expressed about the status of personal narratives as historical evidence in terms of reliability and representativeness in particular. Some historians who work within that historiographical tradition or culture use personal testimony, but as a source of data rather than to give access to the subjective. The economic historian um, Jane Humphreys, for example, writes of making a ruthless attempt to strip out fact from subjectivity in the 600 memoirs that she uses in her very impressive study of childhood and child labour in the British Industrial Revolution published in 2010. Through the aggregation and averaging of the data so collected, she challenges prevailing views of child labour among economic historians. But it's evident that she wasn't able to ignore the subjective content of the memoirs completely. She writes that the autobiographers led her down new paths where her gaze was redirected from economic models and determinants to, in particular, the experience of family life and relationships. The limitations of her engagement with that world, however, 
illustrates the challenge of moving from the quantitative to the qualitative. As the oral historian Daniel James puts it, if personal narratives provide a window onto the subjective in history, the cultural, social, and ideological universe of historical actors, then, he says, it must be said that the view they afford is not a transparent one. In other words, as, as we here today certainly know, seeking the subjective presents historians with numerous challenges. And in what follows, um, in my 20 minutes, I thought I would just discuss three such challenges summed up under these headings of regimentation, diachronics, and technologies of the self. So to start with what I'm sort of slightly jokingly calling regimentation, one of the things that historians who use letters as historical documentation worry about has been the ways in which letter writers followed regimes of letter writing taught at school and available in published collections of letters. Charlotte Erickson, writing a history of US immigration from migrants' letters in the 1970s, argued that following models caused letter writers to write in formulaic ways that masked their true feelings. But scholars who have more recently explored the consciousness of soldiers in the First and Second World Wars of the 20th century from their letters have developed a different way of looking at this issue. John Horne and Martha Hanna, for example, see models for letter writing as themselves conduits of expression for the accounts of experience and feeling inscribed by the author. And, and they and quite a number of historians subscribe to the idea that epistolary models channel the emotional regimes within which letter writers lived and wrote. They contribute to understandings not only of what one could say one felt, but also what one could feel. Yet, this was not always as restricted, as regimented, as might be supposed. Epistolary models could also be deployed for personal purposes, as de Certo's idea of bricolage suggests. Martha Hanna uses that idea nicely. She discovered that French elementary schools taught in an institutional context pupils to be frank and emotional in personal letters they were writing in pre-war civilian contexts. That discovery helped Hannah to explain the relative openness of soldiers' letters from the French front in World War I. Martha Hannah found letters that were blunt about the horrors encountered and feelings of despair and open about fluctuations in confidence concerning victory. In spite of awareness that these letters, written within a military institution, might well be censored. So the argument here is that individuals in history have agency. The adaptation of the guidance, cultural, social, institutional, that builds an emotional regime is part of the process of constructing a sense of self that is not entirely regimented. Censorship of letters has made letters suspect in the eyes of some historians. Wouldn't letter writers omit grim realities and true feelings in the expectation that they would be erased by the censor? Or if they let them slip in, wouldn't they indeed be blacked out? There's plenty of evidence of the inefficiency of censorship in both World War I and World War II. And historians have presented numerous examples of subversion um, by correspondence on both sides of the military divide. One example that I like particularly is Gajendra Singh's work um, from within a, a post-colonial framework in his book, The Testimonies of Indian Soldiers in the Two World Wars. He shows that the Indian soldiers, or sepoys, recruited to fight with the British Army in the First World War, used metaphor and evasive modes of expression in their letters home, including phrases like, think about this and you'll understand it, to baffle the British censors. In this way, sepoys subverted censorship, communicated feelings that they wanted their correspondents to hear about, constructed themselves as a specific type of loyal yet rebellious imperial subject and avoided punishment for doing so. An important insight about epistolary models concerns gender 
as Dina Goodman has shown in this book in the context of late 18th century France, young upper class women were taught to write in specific ways deemed feminine. They were instructed to produce letters that were apparently naturalistic, emotional, quotidian. Penmanship, orthography, handwriting, spelling had to be mastered or mistressed, and the right reading undertaken to develop both style and suitable content. Letter writing manuals offered instruction on the composition of formal and informal missives. Following such patterns was a route to maintaining and enhancing position within the social hierarchy. But, argues Goodman, it was also more than that. It was also the means by which writers produced themselves as subjects in relation to other subjects, such that correspondence helped women, and I quote, to arrive at an understanding of what it meant to be a woman, to confront and work through the choices that womanhood entailed, and to arrive at some degree of autonomy as women. Now I've gone on and on about letters. Letters are not the only types of personal narratives, obviously, for which there are, there are, model, there are models. Memoirs, too, follow fashions, regimes that shift with changes in the emotional cultures within which they're written. James Barrett shows in an article how American communist memoirs of the mid-20th century were shaped by the emotional cultures of both Soviet communism and contemporary US society. <coughs> the result was considerable continuity with the emotional norms of US society in memoirs written by communist men. Men didn't write about intimate aspects of the personal, notably love, affection, family, and friendship, but focused on their engagement with politics. On the other hand, there was discordance where memoir, memoirs written by communist women were concerned. A commun, according to communism's egalitarian norms, love, affection, family and friendship weren't suitable topics for women memorists either. But in American society, it was considered normal for women to include such things, especially accounts of love affairs, marriage and affection for children. Barrett argues that, communist, that American communist women memoirists were caught between two emotional regimes and that the resulting tensions are visible on the pages of their memoirs. To move on to, to diachronics, the problem of diachronics, the, a dimension of memoirs and oral histories that has worried some historians is their diachronic quality. That's to say, they're written or spoken at one point in a life about an earlier point. They bring two subjectivities into conjunction, me now and me then, joined by memory, which as Alan McGill succinctly puts it, is an image of the past constructed by a subjectivity in the present. Interpretations of the past that have become publicly available over time are integrated into personal memory narratives. They mediate self-understanding and influence the meanings attributed to experience contemporaneously and retrospectively. So the present in which the life story is composed shapes the past that it addresses. One historian who embraces this dynamic in a recent article is Emma Griffin. She explores mother-child relationships in Victorian Britain through the memoirs of Victorian childhoods written in the 20th century. She suggests that the memoirist writing in the 20th century confronted, and chained, confronted changed ideas about mother love that were circulating at the point at which they wrote. She finds that their memoirs negotiate between these ideas and their experiences within a different emotional culture in Victorian England. She, some, some memoirists had difficulties incorporating the 20th century language of maternal love into accounts of family love in which declarations of love didn't feature. Rather than seeing the memoirs as offering flawed evidence of Victorian childhoods, Griffin reads them dualistically, both to understand the 20th century paradigms of maternalism through which the authors reviewed their 19th century experiences, and to explore contrast between emotional practices in the two centuries. Michael Roper similarly embraces the tension between the present and the past in his discussion of Lyndall Erwick's multiple versions of his memoir of the first, his First World War experiences. 
He actually wrote six memoirs. Roper explains differences in these six accounts as in part the result of shifting emphasis in the popular view of the trench warfare of the First World War. As a heroic and honourable struggle, the way it was seen at the time and in its immediate aftermath, or as an exercise in futility that was horrifically wasteful of young lives, as it has been since the 1960s. In the first inter interpretation, to be invalid invalided out with enteritis before a major offensive, as Erwick was, smacks of cowardice and needs explanation, which Erwick put into the first memoirs that he wrote. In the second interpretation, Erwick's suffering is part of the collective agony imposed on soldiers by an arrogant and detached leadership, the lens through which he wrote in the 1970s. Roper explains the variations in the six memoirs that Erwick wrote, in part in terms of the diachronic dynamic. He also emphasizes the life stage of the writer and its relationship to his psyche, drawing on Kleinian concepts of splitting and screen memories to elaborate the tensions and omissions in the accounts. In oral histories, some historians explain the difficulties that narrators have in describing experiences in terms of prevailing public discourses at the time and in the present. So Juliet Pattinson, for example, discusses her oral history interviews with women who worked for the Secret Service, the SOE, in World War II. She found that they struggled to talk about being trained to kill, and she relates their difficulties to an enduring cult cultural construction of women as life givers rather than life takers at the time and in the present. Those who used their lethal skills produced elaborate explanations for their deviance from gendered social and cultural norms. And the sociolinguist Charlotte Lind argues that explanations are used in life storytelling when narrators want to establish the truth of propositions about which the narrators themselves feel uncomfortable. The male secret agents, on the other hand, speaking within a cultural paradigm in which women, sorry, in which men were and are constructed as naturally belligerent, in the main felt no need to explain themselves as killers. For those few men who did have qualms, even the option of explanation appeared not to be available. They were, argues Pattinson, rendered silent by the dominant discourse of natural masculine aggression. Now, in that case, the case of gendered cultural constructions of killing, Pattinson argues for continuity between past and present, such that the me now, recalling the me then who killed, belong within the same cultural framework. Where such frameworks have undergone change, oral history interviewees experience different kinds of pressures. So Rebecca Jennings writes of lesbians in the 1980s, recalling with rueful irony their experiences of the 1950s and 60s, an era when there was no positive discourse of lesbian life. Jennings also suggests that the cultural narrative of the liberating effects of the Stonewall Revolution of 1969 acted as a constraint on recall of the later period. After that date, gays and lesbians were supposedly able to come out proudly, but this strong discourse, she argues, frequently inhibited recall of post-1969 lives that were not experienced in that way. The interviewer in oral history and the readership for a memoir themselves exert an influence in the present over the account of past subjectivities that a memoirist gives. Historian Annie Devonish discusses the memoirs of three Indian women politicians whose careers span the 1920s to the 50s. They wrote their memoirs in the 1970s at a time when a feminism insisting on gender difference and demanding an end to discrimination was developing in India. The memoirists, committed to egalitarian feminism, positioned themselves against that type of feminism. The three women constructed their political careers as free from discrimination, 
and their progress was based on merit alone. Devonish, using other sources, points to the suppressions and omissions that the composition of such accounts required. So, for example, one of the memorists was silent on her marriage, widowhood, remarriage and divorce from a violent second husband, which was a sort of sequential violation of prevailing taboos that led Gandhi to exclude this woman from the executive of the Congress Party in 1936. The woman makes no mention of this discrimination in her memoir, according to which she made a, a deliberate and voluntary choice to move away from the centre of power and devote herself to the Gandhian philosophy of rural self-sufficiency. The feminist and post-colonial lenses which Devonish uses enable her to tease out the didactic and intergenerational motivations behind such selective constructions of a past self in a memoir. Her analysis of this selectivity adds to, rather than undermining, the history at stake. Last section, moving on. Technologies of the self. Any genre of, of personal narrative could be considered a technology of the self. That is a technique for making the self visible to the self and for self-control. Diaries have this quality particularly strongly. Keeping a diary is a way not only of observing the world around, but also of managing the self and subjectivity on a continuous basis. Diaries are less directly aimed at an audience or a readership than letters, memoirs and oral history. They are also less subject to revision than other written forms. Hence the processes by which unconscious material is assimilated into consciousness can be more apparent. Several historians use diaries to explore aspects of the writer's subjectivity that diarists themselves were unaware of. For example, Amy Bell draws on Second World War diaries to explore fear during the Blitz. She argues that contradictions between the British public discourse of the stiff upper lip and intimate responses to the bomb bombing surface in unconscious inclusions and uses of language. So she reads fear in diarist documentation of physical symptoms like nausea and diarrhea and accounts of the use of calming products in descriptions of the cityscape battered by bombs, and in the act of inscribing the diary itself, notably in changes in handwriting and lapses in grammar, spelling and punctuation. Michael Roper writes in a similar way about the First, about the, uh, the, the first World War soldiers' letters. The size of the handwriting, the stains of, on the paper, whether they be blood, sweat, tears or jam, tell their own story about the state of mind of the writer, as do the use of clichés, the repetition of particular words and phrases, omissions and self-censorship. The concept of the technology of the self suggests or sort of points to the idea of successful self-management through self-narrative. The idea is that self-review contributes to a process of psychic integration or composure. Oral history has been likened to the talking cure, and diary and memoir writing are recommended by health practitioners for therapeutic purposes. The paradox of correspondence is that by corresponding with someone else and constructing their subjectivity in the pages of the letter, writers come to know themselves. But some oral historians have noted the discomposure that affects narrators confronting unexpectedly difficult aspects of their pasts. And some theories have suggested that diary writing specifically has the opposite effect to psychic integration. Diaries are discontinuous documents. They're broken up by the calendar and by lapses in diary writing and guilty reprises. A different self is expressed in each entry. Some historians focus on the contradictions between one view or state of mind and another in successive diary entries. So, for example, Roger Woods um, draws on the diary of Victor Klemperer, a Jewish convert to Protestantism living in Dresden during World War II, to argue against either or historical interpretation, in this case uh, between the idea that Germans were led unwittingly into the consequences of Nazi anti-Semitism and the idea that Germans colluded en masse with those consequences. 
Woods shows how within the entry for a single day in 1942, Klemperer contradicted himself. In the morning, he recorded arguing with a Jewish neighbor that not all Germans were culpable. In the evening, he stated in his diary that they must all take responsibility for Nazi atrocities and face punishment should the Axis be defeated. Woods, like other historians, many other historians who've taken the personal term, argues for a conception of history that doesn't ride roughshed over such contradictions, such unevennesses, does not, in fact, deal in binaries. So, I'm going to conclude rapidly, um, and I'm going to conclude with just four statements. Okay. The first is, the production of testimony has a sort of bursting out quality. Even though narrators articulate their stories within generic constraints that channel the emotional regime of their time and place, they exert agency. Secondly, diachronics, the relationship between past and present, as well as other relationships, such as the interplay between public discourse and personal narrative, between culture and subjectivity, are part of the history that we can and need to study. Thirdly, the deployment of technologies of the self to make the self visible to the self goes beyond consciousness and can be revealingly messy. And, I think, gloriously, personal narratives enable historical study that captures the contradictory nature of experience, confounds simple binaries, and challenges the idea of coherent historical construction.